This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by IBM. Big data at the speed of business. Welcome to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and thank you for joining me for another two hours of Straight Talk Radio. I want to take a moment to welcome U.S. military personnel who are joining us over the Internet, especially those of you who are serving in remote locations. Thank you for your service and for being with us again today. In just a moment, former second lady, historian, and author Ms. Lynn Cheney will be with us to explain why partisanship and divisiveness has a much longer history than we imagine. For those of us who wonder what purpose the infighting we see in our nation's capital can possibly serve, in today's program, we find out how and why the first oppositional party was formed. But before Cheney joins us, as is my custom each week, let me tell you a little about her background. Lynn Ann Vincent was born in Casper, Wyoming. Her mother was a deputy sheriff and her father a successful engineer. Cheney received her bachelor's degree in English literature from Colorado College, her master's from the University of Colorado, and her Ph.D. from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Then in 1969, nine years after meeting him, Lynn Vincent married her high school sweetheart, Dick Cheney, and together they raised two daughters, Elizabeth and Mary. From 1986 to 93, Cheney served as chairwoman for the National Endowment for the Humanities. And in 95, she founded the American Council of Trustees and Alumni, an organization devoted to education reform. From 95 to 98, Cheney also co-hosted CNN's Crossfire. She served on the board of Lockheed Corporation until 2001, when she stepped down prior to Dick Cheney's inauguration and assumed the role of Second Lady of the United States. Today, Ms. Cheney is a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute for Public Policy Research and has authored and co-authored more than 12 books. And today, we're going to talk about her recent book, which the New York Times heralded as the most important book to be written on our nation's fourth president, a detailed account of the man known as the father of the Constitution, James Madison. It's my pleasure to welcome to the Costa Report former second lady, historian, and best-selling author, Lynn Cheney. Thank you for being with us today, Ms. Cheney. Well, it's a pleasure. Thanks for uh, having me on your show. Now, your newest book is quite an achievement. Uh, It not only sets the record straight about our fourth president, but it also puts the current partisanship in Washington and the struggle we seem to be having with government overreach into proper perspective. Would you agree? Yes, I think those are two different things, but I would agree with both points. You know, it, it's it's difficult to know whether what's happening in our government uh, today is unusual if we don't know what happened before. So in this respect, examining what our nation was going through when Madison was elected president helps us to see that we're still a young nation that's that's struggling with many of the same issues as we did then, uh, limits, uh, you know, issues like the limits of the federal government, which I I think you cover very well in your book. Well, it's certainly true that uh, we are young in a sense, but it's also true that uh, when when the uh, founders established a, a republic, a large republic, they were doing something quite unprecedented. And so in that way, we're old in the history of uh, republics. It certainly is the case, though, that uh, Madison understood, probably as well as anyone else, that um, the nature of a republic was uh, to have people with different views and opinions and values, and that uh, they would naturally uh, come into conflict. And that uh, sound we hear that's so irritating, and to me as to everyone else, of you know the, the bickering in Washington and, and the very uh, robust arguments at times, in some ways that's the noise that a, that a republic makes. Um, people uh, and uh, the leaders that they uh, represent have, uh, have uh, different uh, views that they'd like to see prevail. And uh, Madison was uh, one of the first to make clear that, you know, if you have something that you believe in that you want to see go into effect, you'd better fight for it. But in those days, we seem to have more um, manners and tolerance. Did we? <laughs> I, I just got that impression from your book that we had this sort of sense of tolerating each other's passions. 
Well, you know, Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr had a duel. Um, they killed one another uh, over uh, political um, comments. So I think that perhaps it was more ritualized, but it was certainly every bit as uh, vituperative as in our own time. Um, even um, a man like Madison, who was um, very discreet, uh, would you know vent his feelings about some of his fellow um, uh, American leaders um, in letters to uh, Jefferson. Yes, yes. Now, Madison was a complex man. He suffered from epilepsy, uh, and he was a, he seemed to be more cerebral than charismatic. And uh, if you didn't understand his thinking, well, it might look like he switched sides, first for being in favor of a strong federal centralized government to preside over the states, and then later observing that the government was becoming maybe too powerful under the leadership of of Hamilton. Uh, Some historians have described this as a kind of flip-flopping, but you see it as more of a reaction to Hamilton maybe going too far. Is that right? I think Madison was chiefly concerned with the dangers to a republic. Mm -hmm. And in, in the beginning, at the Constitutional Convention, he, he was quite convinced that the states were the source of danger to the republic. They were um, issuing paper money uh, that was valueless because they kept uh, the printing presses, so to speak, uh, rolling. Uh, they passed laws that forced um, merchants, uh, people who were uh, holding debt, to accept that paper money um, in uh, exchange uh, for debts that had been incurred when the money was worth far more. Um, They were uh, fighting with one another over um, access to ports. They were uh, conducting their own foreign policies. And Madison saw all of that as the greatest danger to the republic or to any republic. That kind of uh, power uh, in many centers that was in constant uh, conflict, um, not only powers with one another, but uh, with the uh, with the national good. Well, I can't um, help but draw and, uh, some parallels. We're we're printing money that isn't tied to anything today, also, aren't we? <laughs> that's a good point. Um, I knew Jack Kemp very well, and mm-hmm. uh, he uh, was a constant uh, advocate for going back to the gold standard. And uh, when you read about the early days and the dreadful inflation that people faced, um, you begin to understand the point he was making. Mm-hmm. And and Ron Paul, I think, brought that up very early on. He, he was saying that once money's not tied to anything, uh, its value uh, becomes uh, you know, political. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, I, I think Madison was, uh, was very concerned about uh, our, our going to uh, a, a, cur- a paper currency, and, uh, and in particular, the formation, the possibility of forming a national bank. Well, the, the bank, as he uh, saw it, was uh, not necessarily a bad thing. It was a way for uh, the federal government to, uh, to get loans in emergencies. Um, It it wasn't in itself a bad thing, but the Constitutional Convention had turned down the opportunity to give the Congress the power to charter a bank. Mm -hmm. And so Madison was um, outraged when Hamilton uh, blithely acted as though um, that were no hindrance at all. Hamilton chose to look at the uh, general welfare clause of the Constitution and the necessary and proper clause as allowing the federal government to do almost anything. And that was the basis of their um, of their animosity. It was intellectual in part. They were very different personalities as well. But Madison simply thought that if you wanted to do something that wasn't in the Constitution, you were obliged to pass an amendment to the Constitution. Yes, he, he liked structure and formality. Although you do point out in your book that uh, Hamilton and Madison collaborated on the Federalist Papers. So... Uh, this came. This d- difference came a little bit later. Now we have to take our first scheduled break. When we come back, we're going to find out why Madison is called the father of the American Constitution. You're listening to the Costa Report.
The crisis in the Ukraine is the latest global conflict to pit the United States against Vladimir Putin's Russia. While the Cold War may have ended, U.S.-Russia diplomacy is here to stay. Understanding this volatile new era is not easy. For many years, experts have been trying to explain Russia's new leadership, but cracking the inner circle has remained elusive until now. The American Program Bureau represents some of the most knowledgeable and prominent Russian insiders who are available to speak to your organization. Experts such as Mikhail Gorbachev former leader of the Soviet Union and master architect of modern-day Russia. Vladimir Posner, the dean of Russian journalism. Andrei Kosarev, the first foreign minister under Boris Yeltsin. And Pavel Palashenko, chief advisor for 25 years to Gorbachev, are available to speak at your next event. No Speakers Bureau offers greater insights into how Russia impacts our economy, our world, and our lives. To schedule these esteemed leaders for your next event, contact the American Program Bureau at 800-225-4575 or apbspeakers.com. Every day our world gets more complicated. Not only is new information coming at us faster than we can manage, new regulations, technology, and the effects of globalization have made it much more difficult to succeed. That's why I wrote The Watchman's Rattle, a book that, for the first time, explains how complexity makes it hard to separate facts from fiction and eventually causes us to make important decisions based on unproven beliefs. And not just us, our leaders also fall prey to this phenomena. But here's the good news. Once you know the symptoms to watch for, you can safeguard against them. So please, go to RebeccaCosta.com. That's RebeccaCosta.com. And order your copy of The Watchman's Rattle. It only takes a few minutes and the shipping is free. That's RebeccaCosta.com. Do it now. You'll be glad you did. Hi, Registered Pharmacist Ben Fuchs here. I've been studying healthy bodies for 35 years, and what I've got to tell you may shock and surprise you, but if you listen up, it may change your life. To the list of discredited scientific truths, you can now add the scientific theory that states that all proteins arise from the simple activity of genes, thus the notion that we have genetic diseases, and that's that. Well, as it turns out, that's not that, and we actually do have a lot of say in how our genetic destiny shows up. Genes are responsive to our environment, Genes read the circumstances that a cell is residing in by interacting with various biochemicals. Some of these biochemicals may tell a gene that a stress is occurring and a specific protein must be produced and a gene that codes for that protein turns on. Others may tell a gene that all's well in the world and the appropriate protein needs to be produced that way. In essence, genes are in a constant state of flux based on their reading and activation of these mediating molecules, and this is the science of epigenetics. And the various molecules that are responsible for activating a given gene or genes is said to be epigenetic factors. Thus, whether or not a gene turns on and results in the formation of a protein is regulated by epigenetic elements. For example, thoughts and emotions can be epigenetic. So can drugs. And, of course, nutritional factors also play a key role in determining whether a specific genetic sequence is activated. All of these are examples of epigenetic factors, and they are the key element in determining what kinds of genetic proteins will be produced and what functioning will ultimately occur in a given cell. Pharmacist Ben here urging you to go to kscohealth.com to order Beyond Tangy Tangerine, the Healthy Start Pack, and other nutritional supplements that I personally use and recommend. You can purchase these premium quality products at wholesale prices online at kscohealth.com. That's kscohealth.com. I'm the pharmacist that believes that staying healthy and strong is not only about medicine. It's about giving your body the raw materials it needs to do its work. Go to kscohealth.com. Make sure you check out the cool videos too at kscohealth.com. That's kscohealth.com. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is former second lady, historian and author Lynn Cheney. And before the break, we were talking about James Madison's difference of opinion with Hamilton, despite both of them collaborating early on on the Federalist Papers. Uh, over time, Madison became concerned with overreach by the federal government. Now, you make the case that without Madison's first draft of the Constitution for the state of Virginia and his calling of and implementing uh, the Constitutional Convention, including making sure George Washington attended the convention and that uh, the important delegates from all states and the most influential people in the country uh, attended, um, that we might not have the Constitution. Is that right? Oh, I think that's right. Um, 
Washington is often referred to as the indispensable man, and certainly he was that. But Madison, in his own way, was indispensable, and I do think that it's hard to imagine how we would have gotten to a constitution without him. What did he do that made the, that made the constitution possible? What was his role specifically? Well, some of it you outlined. He um, knew that getting Washington to the convention was uh, one of the most important things that uh, could happen, that, that he could accomplish, because everyone had such enormous respect for Washington. But Washington wasn't about to uh, plunge into an activity that wouldn't uh, do his reputation any good. And so Madison was not only writing letters to Washington to try to persuade him, he was making sure that the finest uh, citizens, the most upstanding citizens from various states attended. And he was then sending Washington the list so he knew that uh, Washington knew that he would be uh, amongst peers. Um, Madison uh, traveled to New York to be sure that the uh, Continental Congress, uh, or the Congress of the Confederation, rather, didn't um, interfere with the uh, organization of the Constitutional Convention. Um, He, uh, as you say, set the agenda for the convention with the Virginia Plan. He went to Philadelphia early with uh, his agenda and uh, went there early so that he could talk to delegates as they arrived, particularly those from uh, Virginia and Pennsylvania, and convince them of of the direction in which uh, uh, he thought the uh, convention should head. He certainly didn't get everything he wanted at the convention, but he uh, was absolutely crucial to the kind of uh, government that we, we have today. And he was also crucial, as you pointed out, uh, along with Hamilton, in getting the convention, uh, the Constitution, rather, uh, ratified by writing the Federalist Papers, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, In some ways, he was an astute PR man. I mean, he knew that if there wasn't a laying on of hands, that the Constitution wasn't going to stick. Exactly. And he also understood the importance of helping to form public opinion um, with the Federalist Papers, for example, but he knew how to use them. Um, they, they became a talking points for the people in Virginia. They were written for New Yorkers. Uh, Madison and Hamilton had, had uh, directed them at New Yorkers, but Madison understood that a lot of people in Virginia who had a, a general understanding that the Constitution was a good idea Um, didn't have the arguments ready at hand. And so the Federalist Papers sent to Virginia um, and to the delegates who were going to uh, decide whether the Constitution would be ratified by what was the most influential and largest state in the Union, um, they had uh, the arguments before them that they could then use in the convention. So, yes, he had an understanding of public relations um, and of the public that was uh, quite sophisticated. Yes, he did. Um, I remember my first job, my dad said, don't ever call for a vote unless you know how everyone's going to vote beforehand. You don't want it to be a surprise. And there was something about the way Madison operated in that um, I, I think he worked the, the he, he worked the the delegates and he and he worked the participants ahead of uh, time. Um, and, and he just seemed to be a very skilled statesman. Mm-hmm. As I say, though, he didn't get all he wanted at the convention, and yes. uh, he was frankly surprised, I think, when um, the uh, convention uh, took the crucial votes that led to our having a Senate in which the states are representative states and a House of Representatives where there is proportional representation. Mm -hmm. Madison really thought there should be proportional representation in both bodies, and he believed so firmly in this principle and thought that it was uh, was the only just uh, way to uh, uh, see that the people's uh, voice was uh, represented. But I think he was frankly surprised when the uh, delegates went in another direction. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, you never get everything you want. <laughs> right. You have to, yeah, you have to be prepared to make some compromises, and it turns out that uh, this was a good compromise to make if you had to pick one. Now, bringing all of this home to uh, what the country's experiencing today, um, there's no way that Madison or other of our founding fathers could have conceived of the technological changes that we've gone through in such a brief span of time 
or, or how we're now struggling with some basic definitions, you know, things like uh, enemy combatant and, um, you know, some, some brave scholars are saying that we need something like a constitutional convention again because the Constitution has to evolve and be uh, amended to fit the world uh, as it is today. While there are a lot of people that are really afraid that the principles will be hijacked by, you know, private agendas, big business. What do you think? Is the, is the Constitution keeping step with where we are today? Well, I certainly think so. If, uh, you know, people are sophisticated enough um, to really consider that what it is is a document about principles. Yes. And uh, the Supreme Court, for example, just decided that if the um, police stop you, the cases involved, both involved the police stopping uh, people in cars, uh, the Supreme Court decided that uh, you do not have to have your cell phone searched, that mm-hmm. that involves unreasonable search and seizure in the words of the Constitution. So if you think about that, it's pretty interesting, because first of all, they could, the founders couldn't have imagined cars. <laughs> yeah. And secondly, they couldn't have imagined cell phones. But here is the Constitution uh, used as a basis to make a decision involving cars and cell phones. So, uh, you know, I think I think it, it has a timeless quality to it. And frankly, the idea of a constitutional convention scares the heck out of me. Um, it does. Once you start. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> once you start taking the Constitution apart, you know, I'm not sure you get it back together again. Uh, it might be Humpty Dumpty. Can't put all the pieces back. Hmm. Exactly. But but there is another argument to that, and that is when the exact same passage in the Constitution can be used to argue opposite sides of the same argument, um, you know, that sometimes a, is a sign that a principle has become so broad that it's uh, it's almost in danger of being irrelevant. I don't know if that argument really applies, but some people say, you know, if you can use something for both sides of an argument, then really what what is it uh, saying? It's, it's not specific enough. But, you know, I agree with you. I think once you open that door, um, you better watch out for what's going to come. It's, all, it's not always an improvement. I, I tell people, you know, sometimes we try to make forward progress, but you have to make 11 steps backwards. And I don't know if this is a time to make 11 steps backwards with what's going on in the world. And we have to take another break. Uh, stay right where you are. We'll be right back with more from Lynn Cheney. You're listening to The Costa Report. Did you know that every day we create 2.5 quintillion bytes of data and that 90% of the data in the world today has been created in the last two years alone? This data comes from everywhere and it affects everyone. This data is big data. Big data is all data and it's more than simply a matter of size. Big data represents an opportunity to uncover new insights, make your business more agile and answer questions that were previously beyond your reach. IBM's big data platform uses sophisticated technologies and patented advanced analytics designed to complement your existing information infrastructure. The IBM big data platform allows you to get started quickly today and expand to address more complex problems tomorrow. It doesn't matter where you start. It matters that you start. Find out how IBM can help you turn big data into a competitive advantage by visiting ibm.com slash big data today. This is a major KSEO programming alert. Never in our history have so many of our listeners been so concerned about the status of our afternoon drive program, formerly called Happy Hour, currently called Flight 1080, and for good reason. We have had some very talented, but sometimes very rude and abrasive co-pilots on with Dave Michaels, the pilot in command. But all the co-pilots are gone now. What's up here? In particular, everyone wants to know if traffic lackey is history, and if so, why? Find out on the next KSCO special this Saturday, 10 a.m. to 12 noon, right here on What Kind of a Station Is This Radio, AM 1080 KSCO. 
Hi, Kingsman Car Club member Kathy Walls here, inviting you to our 8th annual Hot Rods on the Green Car Show, June 28th and 29th. Bring the family to Twin Lakes Church in Aptos and check out the coolest customs, hot rods, motorcycles, trucks, tractors, and more. There will be local food trucks for a quick bite, kids games, a demonstration by Capitola Police K-9 team, and raffle prizes. For more information or to register your vehicle, check our website, tlc.org backslash kingsmen. Don't miss this show. Coast Paper and Supply has been family-owned and operated since 1948. They have a wide array of products available, including brand name and eco-friendly cleaning supplies, paper goods, and compostable plates, cups, and cutlery. Whether your needs are for business or home, Coast Paper and Supply's friendly and reliable staff have what you're looking for. They even accommodate special orders. You can find them at 151 Josephine on River Street in Santa Cruz. Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 4.30, or call at 831-423-3350. Coast Paper and Supply is a proud member of Think Local First. New Nike ad campaign. Picture Luis Suarez, hard at work on the pitch, and the announcer says, hungry for victory? Just chew it. There's a couple of things I've learned from this World Cup. What have you learned? Yeah, the English suck at soccer. You that is correct. They, they suck. On it. You are correct. Oh, man. You guys have no idea what to do out there. Nope. What happened? I have no idea. That you and that, that uh, Italians are delicious. <laughs> Of course, of course. I knew that was going to happen. Well, you know, you're out there on the pitch and you've gone maybe a few hours without eating. And all of a sudden this Italian guy comes up next to you <laughs> smelling like garlic and olive oil. <laughs> mm. <laughs> you know, you just can't help yourself. <laughs> nom, 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 nom. <laughs> Don't miss Hellbard's Links That Stink with Rick and Rosie on Good Morning Monterey Bay. Every Wednesday at 715 on KSEO AM 1080. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and if you're just joining us, our guest is former second lady Lynn Cheney, who has just released a new book called James Madison, A Life Reconsidered. Now, Madison served as President Jefferson's Secretary of State for two terms before he became president, and they also shared a lifelong friendship, which became one of the most important relationships in forging the future of our country. Can you speak to that for a moment? Well, they had many things in common, and I think that uh, uh, was at the basis of their uh, long uh, friendship. Um, they were from Virginia, both of them, and they understood its ways. Um, they uh, both were seized with a reforming spirit. They didn't like the idea that, uh, you know, Virginians grew up racing horses and uh uh, dancing and uh, gambling and not working hard. They both were uh, <laughs> men who worked very hard and, you know, or even tried to change the South in that regard. Um, they both hated slavery and they both died owning slaves. Um, they uh, were chess players. They liked to play chess together. And I always think that, uh, you know, you can see the chess player in Madison as he advances through his uh, political career. Um, Jefferson was a dreamer. Uh, he was uh, inspired, and he wrote some of the most inspiring prose the world has ever known. Madison was a man more tethered to the earth, more practical. He saw how to get things done, though he had his dreams too. But the two of them, um, you know, were not only deep, but they not only had a deep friendship, they served as a balance to one another. And uh, it was very consequential for the history of the country. Mm -hmm. They were very entrepreneurial and visionary, but as you point out, uh, Madison seemed to have more of a practical bent. But, you know, this this made them a very effective duo. And exactly. Um, Madison, when Jefferson would have a bad idea, you know, Madison would pull him back from the brink. Mm -hmm. But I think he was also inspired by, uh, by, Jefferson's, uh, by Jefferson's inspiration. Mm -hmm. Now, you also write that both men were passionate about religious freedom, but that Madison's motive might have been a, a bit more personal. Uh, at that time, epilepsy was thought to be the equivalent of being possessed by the devil, and Madison knew that that, you know, firsthand that that wasn't true, and he hoped that uh, religious freedom would allow for the truth to uh, emerge. Is that right? 
Yes, I think it was very painful. It it was um, a time when um, uh, people who um, were Orthodox Christians felt under attack from um, uh, the deists, the Enlightenment generally. Mm -hmm. And one of the attacks, uh, largely from David Hume, or he was the leader of it, was against the idea that uh, supernatural forces were at work in our lives and that, uh, you know, devils possess people, uh, that uh, um, God contravened nature um, and caused miracles to happen. And Hume, by questioning all of this, made the Orthodox Christians of the time really quite defensive, and they weren't willing to give up on um, any supernatural interpretation. Mm-hmm. And there is in the Bible a passage in which uh, Jesus um, casts the devil out of a boy who has epilepsy. And therefore, it was strongly believed, it wasn't just casually believed, but strongly believed that epilepsy meant um, satanic possession, it meant you were full of sin, Mm -hmm. and this was very hard on Madison when uh, he first discovered that, uh, when his first seizures began as an adult. And I think that indeed it did play into his belief that none of us should have to ascribe to uh, uh, beliefs that we don't think are true. Um, and I think it did help make him one of the most uh, passionate of the founders about religious freedom. And speaking of being a, a very smart statesman and PR person, he even developed a different vocabulary for describing those seizures, didn't he? Well, I it was... <laughs> he thought very carefully, I think, about talking about his seizures at Mm -hmm. the end of his presidency. After his um, uh, political life was over, he wrote a draft autobiography in which he said that he had uh, suffered from sudden attacks somewhat resembling epilepsy and suspending the intellectual function throughout his life. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he later dropped the word epilepsy. I think he just thought it was too too fraught, you know, that it was just at the end of a long career, it would just be too much, too much explaining to do, too much trying to bring people along. And so he uh, he didn't use that word. He talked about sudden attacks. And suspending his intellectual capabilities uh, also, know, uh, which which is a, you know, I, I'd like that guy as a press secretary. That That's a nice <laughs> way to put that. <laughs> that's, um, that's almost exactly... Uh, a description of what um, neurologists today uh, call sim- complex uh, partial seizures. Yes. Um, you don't fall to the ground and convulse, but, um, you know, you may listen and not understand or try to speak and uh, not be coherent, and it does pass uh, in a matter of minutes. But it's very unsettling, of course, when it happens. Yes, that's right. Now, along the lines of how our personal experiences influence what we do, uh, do you mind if I ask you how your time as a second lady influenced you as you were doing the research and writing a book about the fourth president? Well, I spent my time as second lady, um, I think I wrote six uh, children's books Mm -hmm. um, that were all uh, quite successful and allowed me to make some um, very nice donations uh, to charity. But I've long thought that, you know, it was really important to teach history to kids, that they don't get it um, presented to them in a really interesting way in school. And so I I also saw it as a way to stay out of trouble. You know, I'm not, as long as I'm talking to kids and being pretty simple, though I'm telling you writing children's books is hard work, (laughs) I wasn't going to create some sort of political tension. Uh-huh. So um, I did that as second lady and then began work on Madison um, as uh, the time for uh, for uh, Dick to be uh, vice president no more approached. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, speaking of being the second lady, uh, you make the point that uh, Madison's wife more than made up for some of his reserve and had a lot to do with his success, uh, particularly his election as president. Is that right? Well, particularly in those days, I'm... You know, I'm not so sure now that being a social uh, success in Washington, uh, if one spouse is, that it helps 
just the spouse who's the politician anymore. But in those days, it did. Washington was a miserable place to live. Uh, Dolly opened the, their home on F Street to all of these members of Congress who are living, you know, cheek by jowl in tiny boarding house rooms and had saw to it that everyone had a very good time, that they got to chat with Madison casually about any subject they wanted. And I think it did uh, help people not only respect him, but like him. And in those days, the uh, Congressional Caucus decided the presidential nominations. And so it was a pretty good thing to have people both respect and like you when it came time uh, for the parties to nominate their uh, candidates. Now, frequently I, I talk to former senators and, and former representatives uh, uh, from Washington, D.C., um, and one of the things that they complain about is that a lot used to get done around a barbecue. You know, there used to be a lot more socializing between the left and the right around Washington, and that, that doesn't seem to happen anymore. But, you know, something happens when you show up at somebody's birthday party or you know, you're you're eating a hamburger around somebody's swimming pool. Um, the whole attitude changes, and people seem to be more sociable and willing to listen and and shake hands and work work things out. And uh, and I consistently hear that uh, a lot of that has just broken down, and we don't have as much socializing. So I'm not so sure. Maybe Dolly Madison's approach could uh, make a comeback. <laughs> I, I I don't know. Now we have to take our last scheduled break, but stay right where you are. We'll be back after these important messages from our sponsors. You're listening to the Costa Report. Scott Curatrolli at Curatrolli Cellars is with us today to tell us why it's important for winemakers to focus on and to perfect a small number of wines. You know, really, because we wanted to do sparkling wine and do something different, and that's such a laborious process in being able to deliver that, really focusing on just Chardonnay and just Pinot Noir and making four really distinct wines out of them, a Brut and a Brut Rosé in our sparkling package, and then a still wine Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. To find out more about Caratrulli Wines, visit us at www.caratrullicellars.com or stop by our tasting room in downtown Carmel, California. That's Caratrulli Cellars, C-A-R-A-C-C-I-O-L-I, Cellars, where you have to spell it to drink it. Did you know that every day we create 2.5 quintillion bytes of data and that 90% of the data in the world today has been created in the last two years alone? This data comes from everywhere and it affects everyone. This data is big data. Big data is all data and it's more than simply a matter of size. Big data represents an opportunity to uncover new insights, make your business more agile and answer questions that were previously beyond your reach. IBM's big data platform uses sophisticated technologies and patented advanced analytics designed to complement your existing information infrastructure. The IBM big data platform allows you to get started quickly today and expand to address more complex problems tomorrow. It doesn't matter where you start, it matters that you start. Find out how IBM can help you turn big data into a competitive advantage by visiting ibm.com slash big data today. You haven't experienced yogurt until you've tried a Mossy, embodying health and flavor in a true whole milk, green-fed dairy beverage. Every sip pays homage to our old world cows and the ancient culturing methods their milk benefits from. With over 30 probiotics, a Mossy's undeniably nutritious, refined, cultured sensation bolsters your health and awakens your passion for dairy. A Mossy's so good, and you need to try it. Contact your Longevity distributor or call 877-878-4203 or go to GCNteam.com. Hi, I'm Rebecca Costa, host of the Costa Report. I don't know if you feel a little sluggish in the middle of the afternoon like I do, but if you do, I'm going to suggest you try Pollen Burst. It's an orange-flavored energy drink that comes in a packet, and it tastes a lot like that other orange drink the astronauts used to drink. 
You know the one. Pollen Burst contains vitamins A, B1, B3, B6, B12, pantothenic acid, vitamin D3, and gluconolactone, all designed to give you an energy boost that can last for hours. Pollen Burst comes in a box of 30 packets for $56 or two boxes for $100, and you can order it right now at kscoteam.com. The next time you feel tired and need a little boost, skip the coffee, soda, or candy bar and mix up a cold glass of Pollen Burst and do your body some real good. Go to kscoteam.com. This is Sean from Out in Santa Cruz. Join us this week as we share views from the queer community. We welcome back Mindy Forsyth, mom and blogger, and we will be discussing gay themes in kids' movies, her viral blog on How to Train Your Dragon 2, and her 11-year-old son perspective on LGBT rights. Don't miss out. Saturday at 7 p.m. on KSEO 1080 AM. Check us out at outinsantacruz.com. I'm Sean, and you've been queer. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and today our guest is Lynn Cheney. And we were just talking about how skilled James Madison's wife, Dolly, was in bringing folks together for social events in Washington, which at the time was a pretty terrible place to live. Um, So while you were doing your research for the book, did you make any discoveries about President Madison, which you felt maybe ambivalent about including in the book or which surprised you? Well, I found the uh, epilepsy very interesting. Um, I wasn't certainly the first scholar to uh, read this letter that is in Princeton Library, this draft of an autobiography that he wrote. Mm -hmm. But I was the first one to sort of pay attention to it. It's such a complicated subject. Here is a man that says in 1816, after he's you know, been responsible for everything from the Constitution to uh, the War of 1812, who said that he had sudden attacks resembling epilepsy. And the tendency has been to regard him as a hypochondriac, to say, oh, you know, that he probably didn't really mean it. Well, I decided that he was not a man who used words loosely, and I wanted to uh, to really investigate what it was. And I found that uh, just an interesting and complex subject, particularly when I began to think that it influenced his uh, views on religious liberty. You know, earlier uh, in our talk today, I mentioned that it seemed to me that in uh, in the time of Madison, we had more tolerance. Um, what are the chances we would elect a president today who had epilepsy, e- even with all the modern drugs to control the symptoms? Um, it's it's inconceivable to me that we would, you know, that we would tolerate it. And yet in those days, we believed it to be the possession by the devil. We believed it to be the Satan's hand. Uh, and yet we still could see that the skill far outweighed the de- the uh, the the medical challenge. Well, except that no one knew Mattis. I mean, you know, a very close circle of people. But well, there had to be some you know. people that knew that because when you yeah. phase out, I mean, epilepsy, it's hard to hide epile- an epileptic attack, even if it's not a grand mal seizure. You, you tune out. Right. Um, but I do think that the general knowledge of it was pretty closely held. You know, presidents weren't on TV, uh, of course. There was no television. They weren't on radio. And those uh, were the and, good old days <laughs> right. where and everything so didn't have to quite be so public. <laughs> Madison also became very skilled at recognizing when a seizure was coming on. Um, mm-hmm. And you, you can see this, uh, particularly at the Virginia Ratifying Convention, where he stops in the middle of a speech and says, I have to leave now, uh, and I'll be back in a few days. And he went to his room at the Swan, and I'm, you know, I just feel certain that it was a time when he had a seizure. Mm-hmm. So, so he, he would just that, remove himself. Yes. But your your question is a very good one, because today you couldn't keep it secret. Um, I think that, uh, you know, by the time you run for a high office, you can be pretty sure that your medical records will be uh, looked over with, uh, gone through with a fine uh, tooth comb. Um, But epilepsy, um, you know, uh, Chief Justice Roberts has had, we know, two seizures. So that's 
when you have a diagnosis of epilepsy and is clearly well under control. Um, I agree with you, it would be pretty hard to become president, but I think the other side of that is someone like uh, uh, Chief Justice Roberts makes it very clear that um, in at least uh, some cases, epilepsy can be very well controlled and a full and active life uh, can be uh, can be had even by those who um, are so afflicted. Yes, absolutely. What I, I just love this story because I, I have asked many people, did they know that James Madison, the uh, founder of our Constitution, had epilepsy, and yet we had the wisdom to uh, elect him president, and they look shocked. <laughs> and I said, yeah. well, you know, we, we, in terms of tolerance, I'm not sure that we've become a more tolerant society, and there, there's an example. But as you say, uh, it wasn't exactly public knowledge in those days, and nowadays uh, there's no such thing as privacy. You know, every, every exactly. little thing is out uh, for public display. And if somebody wants to pounce on something and say, well, imagine if this individual had a, a seizure in the middle of, uh, you know, uh, trying to capture Osama bin Laden, um, you know, what, what would have happened, right? Um, uh, there, you know, people are going to uh, attack every little thing that they can find, and they do go looking for it. Now, uh, Madison was the um, president of small government. Uh, but in recent years, uh, we've seen uh, everything from NSA surveillance to IRS overreach. Our, our federal tax code, I think, is over 75,000 pages now. And everything from patent laws to FCC and banking compliance, it's just become so complex and overregulated that it's caused a bit of a paradox. I mean, we want small government, but we also want real oversight over these complex systems. So how how do you make government small with so much overregulation and and so much to oversee well i think you know if madison were to visit us today uh he would certainly understand that the increased size of the nation meant an increased size in government but on the whole i do believe he would be appalled by the scope and reach of the federal government um, or, uh, you know, what he would really be appalled at. I've been thinking about this uh, today. There was another Supreme Court decision um, that went against the president and said that uh, he had no right to make the interim appointments that he did, that he had overreached as a commander and uh, as, as president uh, yes, when he uh -huh. made those appointments. Um, that I think that would appall Madison most, the idea that uh, – um, people believe now, and there's a strong body of opinion, that we need to evolve the Constitution. Mm -hmm. And if uh, it doesn't uh, give us the power to do what we think is right to do, then we simply figure out a way to do it anyway. And principled as he was, and uh, strongly as he felt about um, the Constitution having created a limited central government, I think that would probably shock him most. Well, I agree with you. As I read this book, I thought if we could just bring him in a time machine to the present, he'd be mortified. <laughs> yeah. He'd say, wait, 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 let me explain to you what we really meant. And this wasn't it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, unfortunately, we are all out of time today, but it's been a pleasure having you with us. And uh, I want to thank you for your service to our country and for writing such a masterful book on our fourth president. I truly enjoyed it. Thank you, Miss Jane. Well, it was, it was a great conversation, and I certainly enjoyed it, too. So thank, thank you for having me on. Thank you, and, and come back soon. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Bye. If your station is leaving us after this hour and you have a question or a comment to make about today's program, you can email me at RebeccaCosta.com or drop me a note on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and let me know how you felt about our conversation with Lynn Cheney today. Again, her book is titled James Madison, A Life Reconsidered, and reconsider we should. Kennedy once said that Madison was the most underrated president in American history, and I, I promise you, once you're finished with Cheney's book, you'll understand why Madison was uh, focused on doing, and like so many leaders who'd rather do than argue, he, he got very little credit for his achievements, uh, not nearly enough. And, and by the way, if you missed the full interview with Lynn Cheney today or any of our other weekly guests, remember you can download previous episodes of the Costa Report from our website, Apple iTunes, Podbean, and our new YouTube channel. And while you're at our website, take a moment to check out the new video of the first public debate on the Affordable uh, Health 
exchange and how it's affecting public and private insurers six months after the fact. Uh, The debate's hosted by Fox News personality Juan Williams, and I'm one of the members of this controversial and and really entertaining and informative panel. So if you haven't seen the video yet, go to RebeccaCosta.com, and it's right there on the homepage. And um, if you want to know what's happening to health insurance, this is the one video to watch. So so take a moment to go there and, and, and take a look. I also want to remind those of you who haven't picked up your copy of the Watchman's Rattle yet to click on the image of the book uh, on the website and order your copy right now. This is the only book which shows how complexity, overregulation, and more data than any other time in human history is producing gridlock and a mass confusion between empirical facts and opinions. Uh, Not only are our leaders confused, you and I are also having a a devil of a time making rational decisions because we can't separate fact from cleverly disguised fiction. So get your copy of The Watchman's Rattle. Do it it right now. All proceeds from the book go toward keeping quality programming like the interview you just heard with Lynn Chady on the air today. So uh, so grab your copy at RebeccaCosta.com. My guest next week is former general for the U.S. Army, Mr. Barry McCaffrey, who will be with us to shed light on the Bergdahl hostage exchange from a military and national security perspective, as well as the recent controversy over veterans care and what this means to morale and recruitment. Don't miss General Barry McCaffrey next week right here on the only program that puts policy ahead of politics. Now stay tuned for another hour of Straight Talk Radio. You're listening to the Costa Report.